Right, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to be learning about sea anemones now in our fourth and final installment of the Marine Week webinars for 2022. We're going to hand over to our speaker for this morning, and then we will move on to any um, questions after that. So we really encourage you to send those through. So thank you, Tara, so much for that um, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kersha. I'm one of the educators from the Two Oceans Aquarium Education Foundation. And I'm very excited to be here today to share with you a very interesting animal that some of you may have seen or you may not have seen, but it's a common animal that we'll find along the rocky shores. And uh, that would be the sea anemone. And I'm just going to play this little clip for you. Type of environment where they're found. Uh, these are sandy anemones that you'll find along the rocky shores, especially in our South African coastline, and various species of anemones all over. So some prefer to be in little crevices, some along sandy shores at the bottom of the shore, so covered in water. Um, but these ones you can see are out of the water, so they're very much dependent on the tide as well. But how they can cope is that they close their bodies right now. So some of you may not even realize that these are anemones because of the way they look, because they're all closed up now and they almost look like little muffins in the ocean. Uh, but these are very much anemones and that's what we're gonna focus on today. And just to move on, just to highlight what they look like when they're open, uh, this is a, a kind of anemone that's wedged in between you. And that's what I love about our coastline in South Africa is that we have a huge diversity of life and you can see it's surrounded by various kinds of animals. And this little anemone is wedged in between here. And um, just to give an idea of what it looks like when it's opened, uh, that almost like pretty flowers in the ocean. And just as well, we'll talk about these little blobs later on. So these are closed anemones that you see just hanging at the top here. And that'll be uh, a plum anemone that we will, I'll mention a bit later on. So when we talk about anemones, they are interesting animal. And sea anemones, you'll, like I said, they are found all over along the, the shoreline and submerged in the water, and especially along our coral reefs. And they come in beautiful colors and patterns. I mean, there's these two, is another kind of sandy anemone, this bright orange one here. And in the background, you can see just on the rocks here, there are another kind of species known as strawberry anemones. So very tiny species and um, known as colonial species. So they form these, these polyps. So this would be in a polyp stage. You can see it's standing upright. And uh, I have to also mention that anemones are related to jellyfish. So jellyfish and anemones look nothing alike, but part of the stage of a jellyfish would look like an anemone as they're developing. So this wouldn't turn into a jellyfish, but it would remain like this for the rest of its life. And so if you were to look at the spelling of sea anemone, um, I always like to remind people of uh, where did the, the name Nemo come from? And if you can just, if you just notice the spelling over here, the green N-E-M-O, um, so it's kind of like a Nemo Ni. And clownfish, there is particularly love living amongst anemones, not this one, but there is a giant sea anemone that I'm going to show you later on, on uh, where exactly Nemo lives. So keep those questions about Nemo. We'll get to all of that in a moment. Uh, so let's talk about the body. If you look at the structure of a sea anemone, so they've got larger, la excuse me, rather large <laughs> tentacles all around here. So in the middle, that would be the mouth. And uh, around there would be this group of tentacles and uh, a foot. So a foot to help them to stick on, hold on to any substrate down at the bottom. And what most people don't realize is that a sea anemone can choose to move around. Uh, so they can move, they just prefer to stay in one spot. And they've got these tentacles here to capture their food, which they can just take in straight to their mouth in the center here, in the middle. So they can move, they just look very awkward. They just swim very awkwardly um, when they need to move around. And uh, what would happen if we were to touch an anemone? So if you just have a look at this video of my colleague, she's reaching in, she's touching an anemone here at the aquarium. And notice how each of those tentacles look as if they're sticking to her fingers. And what's happening here is when you touch an anemone, that animal is actually stinging you. So those tentacles are defending this, 
this animal from the human that's touching it right now and it's a form of protection or it's a method of capturing their prey so they've got these long tentacles here that have little stinging cells along it and those stinging cells are there to paralyze their food so if a little fish were to come by and to touch those tentacles that animal is going to get stung it's going to get paralyzed and then eventually those tentacles will close in towards the mouth but why is it possible for us to touch the anemone in this way shouldn't we also get stung by the anemone and that's purely because our skin is quite thick compared to the anemone so we wouldn't feel that at all it's perfectly safe to touch the anemone and there's no harm from that okay uh so yeah so that's the anemone's tentacles in the mouth in the middle so you can always touch the sides here never stick your finger inside the middle i always like to guide people about that because that one more point about the anem the anemone's body is that they are invertebrates they don't have backbones so if you're reaching into a, a little rock pool and you're touching the tentacles be very gentle and then you can just touch around the edges here but never inside the middle and that's because they have a water skeleton so they have a hydrostatic skeleton so they keep water inside their body which pushes against their body walls and then if we were to put our finger inside it that actually interferes with them it may even injure them and it loses pressure it's almost like popping a balloon of water and then eventually the animal would just fall down and lose its, its support structure so that is very important to when we're touching anemones the rock pools be careful not to keep touching the same one just move on to the next one there's always another one to feel and touch uh, so anemones as mentioned they have a very interesting relationship with the clownfish and remember i mentioned nemo a nemo knee and we may know nemo as the animal that lives amongst tentacles of the sea anemone so this is a type of relationship that the anemone has together with the clownfish and the clownfish has a role in order to get this beautiful home to live in he needs to work for his home so being a bright orange color um, you can see it swimming around other fish notice that animal and uh, they they actually are attracted to this area and then what nemo is doing is bringing food to the space and what i didn't mention is probably a question that's burning in your minds is that clownfish they're immune to the sting of the anemone they're the only kind of fish to swim amongst the tentacles of the anemone you see, see the other one in the background and uh, they cannot feel that sting at all so when they start off as babies they still have to develop that immunity and eventually they will become more accustomed to living amongst those tentacles so clownfish are very very important sort of um, relationship with with the, the anemone so not only bringing food the clownfish also clean the anemone so they both work together they both need each other it's a type of symbiotic relationship where we say that they're both gaining so the it's a mutual relationship so we refer to that as mutualism so the clownfish and the anemone both need each other and especially in, in the type of environment that they're found uh, there's not enough food they need to defend themselves from predators especially in the tropical waters and so they've gained they've created this beautiful relationship so that would be with our clownfish another interesting little relationship just to mention here with the hermit crab and anemone so some of you may have seen hermit crabs in the rock pools as well or some of you may have your own little marine tanks and aquaria and this is just give you an example of the relationship of a hermit crab it's a beautiful animal in the shell here and the anemone so the anemone what happens is this hermit crab actually attaches the anemone to its shell because as we now know the anemone is there as a predatory animal and those tentacles are there to defend this hermit crab further so if there were any predators around that were attacking this hermit crab those tentacles would wear off all those predators and to actually tell them stay away from me you may get stung by the anemone so there's a beautiful relationship here with this little hermit crab taking his little anemone which they place onto their shells and if they were to find a new shell because it, hermit crabs need a new shell as in they need to replace their old their old homes because they get larger over time and they replace their new exoskeletons their old exoskeletons for a new one they have to get a new shell and they carefully place this anemone onto its new shell as well uh, so a very cool relationship here and 
we refer to that as a symbiotic relationship known as commensalism. Okay, so there's no harm to this anemone at all, but the the anemone is not really gaining much from it, but the hermit crab is definitely gaining a lot from that anemone. Okay, um, so that would give you an idea of um, the type of relationships anemones have, as well as their biology. These are found worldwide, with more than a thousand species adapted to various depths, and most varied along coast and in tropical waters. They're named after the terrestrial, colorful anemone flower, and anemones have stinging polyps that spend most of the time attached to the rocks on the bottom, the seafloor, or on coral reefs waiting for fish to pass close enough to capture prey with their tentacles. Anemones take food in and expel waste through its central cavity, the mouth. Their bodies are composed of an adhesive pedal disc, a foot, a cylindrical body with tentacles surrounding its mouth. With the slightest touch, the tentacles are triggered. The matices are released with a paralyzing neurotoxin, luckily not harmful to humans due to the thickness of our skin. And the tentacles close slowly, guiding its prey into the mouth. Sandy anemones come in a variety of colors, including pink, brown, green, and blue, generally medium-sized to up to about 10 centimeters in diameter. And the name sandy anemone due to its body covered with sticky knobs in which sand and debris particles adhere to. Prefers a habitat in the intertidal to about 4 meters in depth and it's generally found in pools on the lower shore and interestingly along crevices on the rocks. Often huddled into sandy gullies and round the bases of boulders. They feed on mussels, welts and other mollusks and even urchins. Anemones are quite strong when it comes to holding on to their food before it gets washed away by strong wave action. And these strong waves provide the food for the anemones by tearing off mussels and other mollusks from the rocks. Juveniles are often found in mussel beds. Tube anemones, often mistaken by most people due to the appearance of this animal having an anemone-like body versus a worm-like body. Tube anemones differ from sea anemones both internally and externally. Unlike true anemones, they have two different sets of tentacles. And the first set is slightly longer with tentacles that spread over the surface of mud or sand to capture prey. And the smaller tentacles are used to manipulate food into its mouth. Tube anemones also use their bioluminescence tentacles to startle fish, thus keeping fish from nibbling on them. Long, soft, cylindrical bodies with a pointed foot on the other end. And this foot is used to burrow deep in sand or muddy substrate for an attachment, which then contracts its own hard tube to live in. When you're walking along the rocky shore and you see these blobs of jelly, these are plum anemones. And they can survive the intense changes of tidal patterns by closing tightly when exposed to low tide by trapping that water within their body cavity to prevent desiccation. So that leaves an appearance of this glossy plum red color with smooth bodies. They usually hang from shady gullies and overhangs almost like fruits. And a natural mucus is secreted as with all anemones, which is essential to enhance adhesion, reduce drag forces, prevent sedimentation, limit water loss, and facilitate locomotion. They can detach their foot and catch the current to move to a new spot if needed. However, they are quite particular about social distancing and choosing spots often exposed out of the water with less competition. So I just wanted to show you a bit on the plastics, the impacts of plastic pollution to your sea anemones. And this is, we find very common on along our rocky shores and not a nice sight, but unfortunately, a lot of the anemones end up ingesting plastic pollution. And uh, so we have a huge responsibility to make sure that we pick up all of our litter. If you see it, the beaches may not be yours, but the little things that you can do is just pick it up. Straws, um, fishing line, cable ties, a lot of things that end up in the mouths of the anemones because they don't know better. They just position themselves along the mussel bed and uh, that's how they uh, capture their food and they just wait for food to arrive. 
And unfortunately, the food that was floating by was plastic. So those are little things that you and I can do to protect these beautiful animals. And um, I hope that you guys enjoyed that session. And I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you so much, Kershia. It's really interesting to hear about the different kinds of uh, sea enemies that you get and all the all the various um, aspects that you covered in that. I see there have been there has been a question in the Q and A box so far that was talking about um, uh, the, comparing asking about sea urchins. <laughs> Apologies, um, and saying isn't the sea urchin the one that stings you? Um, I see you commented saying that sea urchins have spines to protect itself from uh, predators. Some are venomous, but none in our local waters, um, which is very reassuring to know that if one stands on a sea urchin or something, they don't need to worry about any of that. Um, then can you tell us, uh, are, sea, are, are, the anemones, are there any anemones that are poisonous um, or dangerous to humans and are any of them in South Africa? Sure, so anemones, um, there's, I think uh, the nice ones are the big larger ones that we see very commonly on our uh, rocky shore and also offshore. and deeper waters but those species they're not venomous in any way they're not going to harm us and um, it's due to the type of sting that they have uh, but definitely there are different species of a class of anemones that uh, are very tiny and those are your hydras that look like anemones so the smaller versions um yeah they're not going to they do have a nasty sting so if you're a regular diver or snorkel or things like that uh, those you may touch things when you're down at the bottom and you may have just touch your face or the, those kind of things, and then you will feel the reaction. And that's the the, the worst case that we would deal with the types of anemones. So yeah, uh, it's more paralyzing to fish. Um, okay. with a, yeah. Okay. Um, and then can people eat anemones? Ah, can people eat in anemones? Um, I think they have done that in uh, the Asian countries, but I'm not too sure. Uh, of how, how often that is, but I have seen them on in the aisles where they have all these various animals and creatures, even sea stars, which amazed me. Uh, but because anemone is just full of muscle, it's not very nutritious to most animals. I mean, you do get some fish, like coral reef fish that like to pick on smaller anemones. And those are like tweezer shaped mouth. Uh, but for humans, uh, in terms of ingesting that, I, I don't think it's any nutrition for us i think it's just seen as a little something different as a delicacy yeah but yeah that's interesting <laughs> okay um and then can you tell us uh, there's a question in the q and a saying what kind of animals would eat an enemies and how would they do that so yeah as mentioned uh, most of your coral reef animals those with um tweezer like mouth so they just pick on coral reefs sometimes large anemones as well so and essentially a coral reef is basically multiple types of anemones and species. They're just very small versions and as well as the big ones. And then you get these nibbling fish that do that. There's also other marine invertebrates, so animals without backbones. So something like a sea spider, they have a very long proboscis like a, like a mouth and they insert it into the anemone because it's got a very soft tissue and they just absorb it all in. So that's how they can get to their food. And there's other animals that do that, just nibble, and because of that, tissue is very soft. Uh, so the anemones need to move, which they can do if they need to. They can pick themselves up and move. Yeah. Okay. And then um, do anemones have a way of seeing what's in the water or is it just through touch that they can sense sort of any predators or where they need to move? Yeah. So essentially they, they cannot see. They, do, they don't have eyes like um, you and I and various other animals, which started off with the, uh, the annelids and those worm-like animals in terms of evolution, how we get the different changes. But anemones, yes, very sensitive to touch and feeling and those, they can pick up those senses and movement such as pressure. So if there's a lot of current coming and they can close up. Sometimes if you're walking in the rock pools, um, they can feel you coming by. So they already will close their tentacles up uh, just to, due to the change in the, the current and the pressure in the water. Uh, so yeah, that's the most they can feel in, in sense of prey, yeah. Okay. Um, and how often would you say they do move? Because I know you said that they move or would you say that it's more of a walk or a swim? And how oh. often does it happen? Is it usually if they kind of need to, you know, change locations? Is it for sort of for food, so for looking for food or how often yeah. does it happen? So, okay. So I, 
how let's say a situation in the aquarium okay so we have new animals that come in we get we don't like to keep our animals for very long and i'm very proud of that because we have animals in and then we have them for a bit so they're completely new to this environment they're not sure they're still adapting so they're figuring out where they want to be i need to find a nice spot where there's going to be current food coming in and those kind of situations so they tend to move a lot and it is quite frustrating because sometimes they block our pipes and things uh, but uh, to prevent blockage and things so we have to check and make, make sure that they're not doing any naughty stuff so that's the the aquariums in captivity but especially in the wild um, if i go re regularly rock pooling and I'll notice anemones, okay, they've been there for, if you do it every two weeks as well, they're still in that same position, it's quite bizarre. But so sometimes you'll see that, okay, the food is used up and there's no more muscle beds or things and they've disappeared. And I really don't think that it's from a predator. They've actually picked themselves up to find a new little space or new niche um, where they can hide in the little crevices and um, rely on any food source. So the tides coming in, which is great, brings in a lot of food for them. Yeah. Okay. And do all anemones live on rocks? Do all anemones? Um, no, so not not all anemones. Uh, some of them like to have a nice flat substrate at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, that's okay. But so they have a little foot like a, uh, and that they create a mucus, like an adhesive that helps them to stick on. But some anemones like to be in little tubes or in the, and they create their own little burrows. So they have that they can hide in. And protect themselves some anemones like sandy environments where they have little buds all along their body on the body walls and then that collects little particles of sand that they stick to and so they can help camouflage and blend in with the sandy environment so there's various types of anemones that we have yeah okay. not all on the flats but sometimes sandy shore so okay um and there's a question saying are there any which can have any medical use I'm not too sure, hey. Um, I thought there was a question. I think we we wanted to look into that. I'm not sure if that was the anemone or the sea urchin at one stage. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure of that one about medical uses for that. So yeah, okay. we'll have to check on that one and share it for the group. Okay, I suppose that's not so much your focus at the aquarium. No, not not at all. We're just wanting to share a lot of information how these animals live in a natural environment. Uh, what sort of impacts are there to him and how we can look after them and simple, simple things like I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what is the most common species of an enemy found on our shores? On our shores? I'd have to say there's quite a few species, but in terms of um, the different classes, you will get the sandy anemones. Uh, that's quite common. Sandy anemones as mentioned and uh, plum anemones. Okay. I mean, those are the ones that are hanging over the little under the rocks and things. There's also another one, I think it's called a false false anemone that uh, has these beautiful stripes on their body on that, but they look like other shells and limpets. So you sometimes you're walking by when they're closed up, you don't even realize you're looking at an anemone because of those stripes. But that said, those are the three, especially along our shoreline. Um, it might differ as you get to the east coast and you'll find different species then you'll start to get zoanthids and um, the coral reefs that's along the east there yeah so, okay very interesting and do you find anemones in different water temperatures um, or, and would they be in temperatures cold as antarctica oh wow that's that's a very good question so anemones are found worldwide and um, they're adapted to various conditions. So like I said, we've got from the East Coast to our West Coast and that temperature range differs. So we can get as temperatures as high as 27 degrees on our East Coast, that's like in Durban side. And then you can get to the West Coast as low as nine degrees Celsius. But definitely you do get them in deeper waters and cold cold environments provided there's enough food source and so a lot of nutrients and for them. So little tiny fish, um, if there's places where animals are in the rocky shores and then they're exposed to high tide that they may fall in that's an opportunity for these animals to take in a quick meal and um, so yeah i think in definitely in those regions you would find some species that is adapted to living in those conditions i'm not an anemone expert like in nidaria so that's the animals we're dealing with they're related to jellyfish but i'm sure there's tons of species that we all need to just go and look up and look into to find those details all over Okay. And can you tell us how many different kinds of anemone species you have at the Two Oceans Aquarium? Oh, <laughs> I have to think about this now on the spot. Uh, 
so definitely tubes and these. Uh, okay, we've got, I'd say we've got over 20 because we've also got the coral reef exhibit. So at the Two Oceans Aquarium, because we have animals for people to see from the West Coast as well as the East Coast. And the East Coast, that's where the diversity comes in. So there's a huge range of all sorts of marine invertebrates as well as the anemones that sort of make up our coral reefs. And um, if there are any of you are coral experts and have your own aquarium at home, you would know that there are species that you can get that you can keep at home and um, you could uh, sort of, what's the word, um, kind of frag and, and you can create your own uh, anemones and coral reefs uh, over time because that's how they can be produced. So it's quite interesting uh, for the species. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then why do you like anemones, Koshia? <laughs> why do I like them? Oh, you know, anemones, they are interesting in the way that they live and they design. I must say, I've seen videos of anemones moving around. I find that quite adorable. A little awkward swim because they can't pick up their feet, their foot, and then just swim very awkwardly. Um, but they're beautiful. I, I always, when I was much younger, I used to think of anemones as pretty flowers. So I'd go around and I'll see all the flowers and um, re not realizing that they're actually animals. So they're beautiful in their own way and just can't get over how the diversity we have. Um, even from one sandy anemone, there's purple, blue, red, um, all range of colors. That's they're just stunning. So I hope that you all can go out and have a look at the, the anemones when you go rock pulling, especially when it's low tide. Yeah. I think I think it's very true. I think often with especially with marine animals, you're never too sure what exactly is in fact an animal, whether it's sea cucumbers or anemones, whether it's yeah, <laughs> you don't know what always characterizes it as an animal, especially when you're when they seem quite foreign. Oh, um, so true. And especially when you just look at tiny things. So if you if you don't even have to walk for, for hours, you just stay in one spot and then you start to lift up rocks, then you'll see all the different tiny animals um, under there. Yeah, so I just wanted to add on that. <laughs> no, it's a good a good advice for for aspiring rock poolers <laughs> to go exploring. <laughs> um, I don't see any other questions at the moment, um, but I see there is a comment in the chat um, saying thank you for a very interesting session from the Collegiate Eco Club. Um, so th thanks for sharing that um, for uh, for our speaker and thanks um, for joining. Uh, I don't see any other questions at the moment, but if anyone does have any questions um, at a later stage or while you're watching the recording, please feel free to email us and we'll pass those on to Kershia at Two Oceans. Um, for now, I see we have reached our closing time. So I just wanna say thank you so much everyone for joining us and especially thank you to Kershia for, for taking the time to share these incredible creatures with us today. We really appreciate all your efforts there. Thank you so much, Tara, and thank you to our viewers as well. Glad that everyone has enjoyed. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Very cool. <laughs> thank you so much. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email us. Um, and we hope to see you at, at the next series. Um, so thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.